Welcome to One Broken Mom, a podcast dedicated to raising awareness of mental health, parenting, and self-improvement. I am the host, Ami Quiricone. One Broken Mom is not a family show. It is meant for adults and contains sometimes adult language. The topics I cover can be serious and unsettling to people. However, I do have a sense of humor laced with a little bit of a punk rock attitude. So if you're interested in real talks about real stuff by real people so that we can all get better together, well, then you're in the right place. And so welcome. All right, everyone, welcome to the show today. As many of you know, I have tackled the topic of narcissism many times on One Broken Mom, and we have mostly discussed its most malignant forms of the disorder because, as many of you also know, I have some personal experience with people in my life whose self-centered tendencies were abusive and traumatizing. Now, I stumbled into this world like most people do several years ago through social media and pop psychology, but I did find a book in 2015 written by a Harvard lecturer on the topic because I was curious about understanding how to live with the narcissist that I had apparently been collecting during my lifetime. In this book, I began to understand the people around me so much more clearly, and I actually ended up developing a great degree of sympathy for the people who were the reasons for me buying this book. The book showed me how parenting can be the root causes for why people develop unhealthy, excuse me, unhealthy levels of narcissism and why some don't. But the most beautiful thing about the book, in my opinion, was discovering where I was on this spectrum of narcissism. I had healthy levels of confidence, bravado, and accountability, but I also saw that I had my own dark sides to my can-do attitude. In 2017, I was easily angered if someone did not see something my way. I had a strong will to always be in power or in control of situations. I had to prove I was right and push on it until I could prove my point. And my ego was certainly bruised very easily if I felt disrespected, and that would prompt me to prove that they were also wrong. It would take, however, a couple of years to sit down and realize that in this was the main sources of my own self-sabotage in business and in personal relationships. It showed me why I steered myself towards the thrill and danger of the seemingly powerful and charismatic people and to understand the whys of the inevitable failures and conflicts that would arise in those relationships. It was because I, too, was narcissistic, and I loved the power and the thrill of being connected with other people who seemed to be like me. So when I chose to start therapy in January of 2018, I told my therapist in the very first session that I was ready to heal and grow, but I never wanted to lose the very real feeling inside of me that I had something important to do for this world. Because I felt, based on Craig's book, that there was a place in our society for healthy narcissism, and that is, in fact, it's vital to our society. So today, it's a tremendous honor to be speaking with Dr. Craig Malcolm. Malcolm, not Malcolm, I know that's what it sounded like, (laughs) the author of Rethinking Narcissism, The Secret to Recognizing and Coping with Narcissists, and to have him help us understand the history of this uh, persona and also how maybe some of us are experiencing it maybe more frequently than we actually think. So welcome to the show, Craig. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. So while I sat here preparing for this interview, um, I struggled to distill down to, you know, my questions into something that I felt like we could cover in an hour because the book, you know, and the book is sitting right here for anybody who wants to see the cover. Um, it's, it's meaty, it's beautiful, it's wonderful. Um, and so it was really hard. <laughs> and so um, as you and I talked a little bit as before we started the interview, One of the things that I actually found really fascinating is I was flipping back through the book and I pulled myself out to this 30,000 foot view level looking at the topic. I really felt like it would be amazing to start with what you did in the book, which was to talk about the history of the quote disorder and how it came to be ultimately defined and diagnosed by the mental health community, because it really is the tale of two theories and one of them won the debates and then became the adopted point of view. So would you mind starting us with a little bit of a history lesson on narcissism? Absolutely. I I think one of the most fascinating things about the origins of the term narcissism is that it first started out with with, uh, almost exclusively sexual connotations. Now, if you remember in Rethinking Narcissism, I mentioned, and I never remember how to say his name. I'm going to confess. I think it's Paul Knack or Paul Knacky. Oh. And he, he was a sexologist. And he basically introduced it as a way of describing a sexual, quote unquote, perversion, narcissism, that is, where people fell in love with themselves and sprinkled themselves with kisses while masturbating. And that was... And that was the original idea of narcissism, literally self-love. 
And it was Freud, of all people, who broadened the meaning of it, saying that, no, no, narcissism is this investment. And he meant literally our energy invested in ourselves when we're younger, primary narcissism, he called it, but from birth, uh, that actually gives us the energy to reach out to others. And that he saw it as something that played a role in, in romantic love, and he saw it as something that played a role in our excitement and admiration of other people. And he sort of wavered on whether or not we should ever give it up. Um, and that was the beginning. That was how narcissism was understood. And I'll jump ahead a little bit to when I was in graduate school, because this is good background, too. We used to joke in graduate school when I was in clinical psychology about each other's narcissism. Mm -hmm. that it had a very different meaning, especially in clinical and mental health contexts. People played with the notion of their narcissism. So there was always this idea of we're all somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. um, and then along came two people. I mean, this is where things really started to change. And I, I, we can do a deeper dive, but I'll just give the overview. Um, they were both from Vienna, and they were both psychoanalysts who, who were – devout Freudian believers themselves. Eventually, they branched off into their own sort of version of things. Uh, one was named Kohut, and the other was named Kernberg. Kohut was born before Kernberg, and he spent, and Kohut spent much of his childhood in Vienna, and he got to enjoy Vienna before the annexation by the Nazis, uh, when, when Germany was expanding its power. Uh, but Kernberg, uh, had to flee to Chile, and even though I wrote it, I'm going to have to remind myself, I believe he was 13, 14 when he had to flee um, with his family, so he lost all those wonderful things about being Vienna, and I'm truly convinced to this day that that's what colored their different versions of what narcissism was. Kohut thought, focused on the idea that Kernberg himself also talks about, which is a kind of playing with grandiosity. Uh, believing ourselves and others to be more exceptional, unique, or special than we actually are. Uh, Kohut believed that we need that throughout our lives to be happy and healthy, to admire others, to admire ourselves, to maintain dreams. Kernberg did as well, but where Kohut thought of it more in a way that, like, almost like it fuels us, like we can dip into it, uh, and it gives us something, that kind of belief, even though it's not, and entirely realistic that we stand out from the other 7 billion people on the planet in some way. Kernberg, uh, who was, I think, probably terrified by what he saw with Nazi Germany, uh, became much more focused on dark narcissism, I'm going to call it, what you've covered as malignant narcissism, and the problem of grandiosity going out of control. Kernberg's uh, Kohut's narcissist was sort of a Peter Pan figure um, who was refusing to grow up, and, Kern, and Kernberg's was a monster out of control. Um, and it was really, and the reason we have the understanding that's really largely about the danger and the, and the darkness of malignant narcissism is because a writer named Lash uh, released a book called The Culture of Narcissism. And in that book, he really focused on the idea that narcissism is dangerous, it's taking over, it's going to cause all of us problems. And even though Kohut and Kernberg both came up with the idea of healthy narcissism and distinguishing it from disordered narcissism, Christopher Lash's book really took over in terms of our understanding. Um, and, you know, at the risk of going on and on, that led to some other developments like the me a measurement tool that we can talk about the narcissistic personality inventory uh, designed to measure narcissism. But I would say we've received that vision from Kernberg and, and Lash largely. And that's why we have the, a focus on malignancy and danger. Mm -hmm. And it seems to uh, also push us away from um, wanting to feel comfortable with embracing you know, some of the things that are the healthy aspects of it, like, you know, because you don't want to be labeled or accused of being dark if you happen to be proud or confident 
or, uh, you know, willing to stand above and beyond other people or, you know, assert yourself and stuff like that. So, I mean, it's, um, you know, that's what's so fascinating about this is that it, it shifted, I think, that, that languaging of making it so bad and playing into the fears of everybody that it, you know, you, it, you know some people tend to swing from the extreme, which is then to push away um, and to, you know, create this kneecapping idea that, well, you know, um, you don't want to stand up too tall because, you know, somebody might knock you down or somebody will think that you're too egotistical or egocentric. And I think that's like, that is a disservice, you know, to, to culture there. Um, Absolutely. Pride is a universal uh, human emotional experience. I mean, you can look at cross-cultural studies and you see people who are in different cultures no matter what their background, we recognize pride in pictures, and that's because to some extent it's wired into us. And one of the things, the focus on disordered narcissism as being synonymous with narcissism and even just sort of moving away or forgetting about the idea of healthy narcissism, one of the effects it's had is that there's conflation or mixing up a confusion of healthy pride and arrogance. Mm -hmm. They are not the same. Feeling proud of ourselves and having big dreams and sort of striving beyond needn't involve, shouldn't, and often and usually doesn't in healthy people stepping on others or 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 pounding our chests, uh, hurting other people to get what we want, looking down on people. That's arrogance. Pride is relational. Uh, pride is the moment when that we all know and remember if we cast our minds back far enough, if we had this healthy experience in our family when you come home at the age of six with your first little test grade and it's an a and your parents are like that's great that's so wonderful congratulations you know good for you sweetie and you put it on the fridge <laughs> that's pride it connects us mm -hmm. arrogance is what strands us and mm -hmm. that's what dark narcissism is about mm -hmm. now you you alluded to then a a way that um you know, to measure it because it, it did it, you know, and again, you're the expert here. I'm just the, you know, I just play one on the podcast. Um, but <laughs> the, uh, there, there needed to be a way of diagnosing it or understanding it so that it could be labeled. I mean, cause we love labels, right? Like we love to pin something on somebody and that's what we do really pretty strongly oh, yeah. today. Um, and so there was this, the NPI, the narcissistic personality inventory. So how did that come into play so that people could start to, you know, stick all their dark labels on every and, and yeah. identify a miserable a miserable measure by all accounts at this point <laughs> but it became the narcissistic personality per, uh, personality inventory became the gold standard for measuring narcissism and what came to be called normal narcissism still is often called normal narcissism um, around 1980 as the first the, the edition of the DSM was coming out with the first diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder, which was a blend of Kernberg and Kohut's ideas. Um, some researchers wanted that publication to coincide with the release of a useful measure. So they came up uh, after a series of months or years, they came up through testing on largely undergraduates because I've done some of that myself. And uh, they developed the Narcissistic Personality Inventory. And it's just a series of 40 forced choice questions uh, that you can get a zero if you don't agree with the narcissistic choice and a one if you agree with it. An example would be, I'm a natural born leader. That's on the Narcissistic Personality Inventory. I picked that one for a reason. Um, uh, what's another... Uh, Another good one is I like to look at myself in the mirror. Obviously, that's not as it's not terrible, but, you know, you don't want to do too much of that. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'm a natural born leader. Uh, if you listen to that question, if you were to agree with that, we, we can probably recognize that there are some really good things about that. Uh, but if you say yes to that on the NPI, you score a one. And you, if you get enough answers like that, you're going to be scored high enough to be a narcissist. And the problem that people started running into and realizing that there's, that there's healthy factors and that the narcissistic personality inventory actually uh, captures healthy narcissism and mixes it in with maladaptive narcissism. So there's nothing wrong 
with feeling like you have a sense of leadership and authority in and of itself, and that's what good leaders need. So the LA measure, think of the, all these mathematical piles that a scale falls into. Where you can think of it as three piles for the MPI, and one is LA, leadership authority, another is grandiose exhibitionism, and the other uh, is uh, exploitation entitlement. Exploitation is doing whatever it takes in order to feel special and get your needs met no matter who it hurts. Mm -hmm. Entitlement is acting as if the world should bend to your will. No, these aren't good things. And, uh, entitlement, which is acting as if the world should bend to our will. And it turns out that exploitation, entitlement, those two factors alone, pretty much explain and capture every nasty quality of unhealthy narcissism there is. Um, uh, aggression in the face of ego threats, um, violence, uh, workplace sabotage. I mean, you name it, pretty much everything is covered. Leadership authority only relates to healthy things. Good relationships are reported by people who just score a high net factor. So what we ran into with the MPI is it was intended to be a measure to help people capture narcissistic personality disorder or people who trend in that direction. And instead, it gave people a global score and they could be called a narcissist and some were extremely high in healthy qualities and low in unhealthy and some were just high in unhealthy and a little bit of the healthy and it was all mixed together. Now we separate them out and now there's lots of measures to capture the healthy aspects. There's four different measures to date, including our own, which is just called healthy narcissism. But this goes back decades. So you have the LA measure on narcissism personality disorder uh, inventory, uh, our healthy narcissism. There's one by a, a researcher named Wink, Paul Wink, called autonomous narcissism, which you can think of as a blend of warps and ambition. Uh, and then there's the admiration measure on uh, a, a new measure, which is way better than the narcissistic personality disorder called the nar narcissistic admiration oh wait narcissistic admiration and rivalry questionnaire or narc, NARC. <laughs> that is what it's called the narc and the admiration factor is healthy so all you know we we've all along once people start to correct this, had built into the measures this notion of healthy and you just want to think of it as um as having road rose colored glasses for the self others the world you know it's not realistic I, i've been criticized uh by a lot of people who don't like the idea of unhealthy narcissism even though it's an empirical fact at this point and it helps us understand other aspects that we need to understand where people have problems with a lack of narcissism of healthy narcissism but it's not self-esteem it's not simply self-confidence it's not self-love it's a slightly unrealistic, positive self-image. Mm -hmm. it's, it's thinking of ourselves with this kind of rosy glow as better than we actually are by objective standards. And it turns out that people who have that uh, thrive and they're able to persist in the face of failure. And they actually have pretty good relationships as long as they don't tip into EE, exploitation and finance. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> what a big thing. Now, where did you step into this dialogue and this evaluation and measurement um, with the spectrum? You know, what made you kind of like, you know, say, let, let's resort this and, and see if we can't come up with it? Because I know that, again, from reading your story, you know, you have some personal experience with narcissistic personalities. Um, and you share it really uh, throughout the book, it's woven into it, the story of, you know, your mother. And, um, and seeing, you know, some of these variabilities in people. Um, and, and what I love also about the book is, um, is this understanding that, um, that we also, because of that dark malignant definition of narcissist, we think that everybody who has very strong narcissistic tendencies are out to, like you said, exploit. But there is this weird concept of, and I call it weird, it's probably not fair, but that there are some people that are extremely, um, passionate persuasive about changing the world and they're and the underlying root of it is that they're actually doing good they they are they're persuasive at getting everybody to love themselves more or and and that's it's kind of the same drive in there right like um it's fulfilling for them 
individually to have that impact. And I, you know, and honestly, I feel like that's, that's how my mindset, my mind view is, is like, there's a charge to me to be able to get, you know, to help people. Absolutely. And that kind of yeah. falls into that, that, that range in that realm in there. And you had shared that. And the reason why I brought that up is you had shared that your mother really seemed to have exhibit some of those characteristics where she really did love to be able to do something for other people. Um, but it, you know, maybe there was um, some other issues that made her challenging, but that you kind of like stemmed from there. I think I just told your story for you and I asked you to tell it for me. So sorry. <laughs> I can add to it. That's fine. I can okay. elaborate. But yeah, no, my mother was a bit, she was a mystery to me in some ways. Even when I started studying narcissism early on, which I would say that was early on in college, I started becoming, as a psychology major, I was fascinated. But it didn't, none of, the, none of the things I read really captured exactly my mother because she, when I was younger especially, she would never have met the criteria for narcissistic personality disorder. She might have met criteria for other problems, but not that. Uh, I didn't recognize in her the kind of uh, pervasive nastiness, which other people do in, in encounter. I mean, I've encountered that in other relationships, uh, but it, this is one of the things that took me a while to kind of figure out what is wrong in my relationship with this person. And I remember being close to my mother when I was younger and, and taking care of her. And of course, taking care of her when, when I was six, there's problems with that that were piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I saw her lifting people up. Absolutely. Uh, she clearly had this sense of specialness about herself. Unfortunately, I think it was largely related to her looks. And I think that's one piece of the puzzle that fell into place later on. But when she was younger and she could just sort of count on being attractive, uh, she lifted people up and she cheered them on and she loved to help and she was active in the community. And it was only when she got older and her looks started to fade, I think, that her insecurities grew and she became more bitter uh, mm -hmm. critical, nothing I did was right. I mean, it was as simple as we're all trying to find our way on the highway somewhere. I'm, I, I, no, I'm not alone. Nobody else knows what they're doing. But it's my fault and I got us lost, things like that. And um, accusing me of stealing money when we raised house to, uh, money, when we raised money to move her after my father died. It was awful. Mm. Um, so, it was in an effort to try to understand how all these different aspects of narcissism fit together that I first started developing my ideas and, and it evolved into wanting to have a measure that captured everything because two big things were missing. One is not all narcissists care about looks or fame or money. All they did. <laughs> some, and some can be extremely shy and quiet and that wasn't talked about much at all. Mm -hmm. Um, and so a lot gets missed about dangers, not just what's, not just what's good, but also what's bad about narcissism. If you don't think about the different types and there's more than just those types. And I wanted a measure that brought everything together. Uh, my big, uh, my big complaint was that there were with the NPI, we had this measure that just kind of threw everything together and it was all confused. And there was this notion from the beginning of Freud's introduction of the, of the idea of narcissism, of healthy narcissism, but it was just sort of floating out there, attached to nothing. And there was even an idea that if we lack healthy narcissism, we're going to run into problems. But that wasn't part of any measure either. Mm -hmm. um, as a matter of fact, there was one measure that, that looked at healthy and unhealthy narcissism, and it looked at when people were high in both, and it looked at uh, when people were up in up in one and down in the other, I think. But the, but when there was like none at all, that part of the graph was empty. Mm -hmm. It was literally nothing there. And I thought, okay, well, there's there's an area of explanation that has not been covered either in this by either theory or by measurement. So I want to do both. So that's when I started to develop the narcissism spectrum scale. And we can talk about my idea of the spectrum and how it brings everything together. Oh, yeah. Um, and, yeah. So, yeah. but I want to leave room for <laughs> a break so I don't go on and on. No, no. I Because this is probably the, um, I think that 
this could be very eye-opening for a lot of people, especially as they start to kind of tune in around themselves. Because like I said, you know, what, what MPI and what this idea that, you know, the, the, the label of narcissism only means one thing, that it's negative, is that it, it just, it sets us up for you either you are or you aren't. And then this inability mm -hmm. to recognize the gray area that really truly does exist, you know, from one end to the other. But as you did on the spectrum, you know, there is the, the absence of some of these things that allow us to stand up and stand forward and move on in the face of adversity is also bad. Like, it's not like the, there's just this end here that you don't want to be this manipulative, controlling, entitled person who takes advantage of everybody and think that if you're the opposite of that, that you're like A-OK, -okay. like there's a, there are issues there. So I think that, you know, you laying this out, um, you know, would be really invaluable because I have this down, um, you know, you have the, the deficits, the healthy, and then the extreme and is kind of like the three parts, but please tell us a little bit about the, about the whole thing here. Let's start at the beginning with my definition of the core definition of narcissism that I came up with uh, to bring all of the research together into one construct, they call it, or, or concept. You want to think of narcissism as the drive to feel special, exceptional or unique, to quote University of Washington psychologist Jonathan Brown. Um, and the reason you want to think about it that way is because there's lots of different ways to feel special. Uh, but very simple, drive to feel special, stand out from the other 7 billion people on the planet. And you want to think of narcissists. And remember, narcissism is not a disorder in and of itself, which is why we have a disorder of narcissism. That's what narcissistic personality disorder is. That is the only disorder of narcissism. So narcissist is not a disorder. Narcissism is not a disorder. Narcissism, you can think of as this trait uh, that's, a, that's a universal human tendency that exists in all of us to some extent, uh, to a greater or lesser degree. Uh, and narcissists are people who are extremely high on the trait of narcissism or the drive to feel special. Um, and you can think of the different types of narcissists, again, as these are people who are dependent on or addicted to feeling special, meaning they turn away from mutual love, caring, and closeness. They don't truly trust that they can depend on other people to help them feel good and close and nurtured and understood, really understood and not alone in their experience and in their feelings. That's what true effective dependency as attachment researcher Bowlby calls it. He talks about effective dependency. Um, narcissists have a particular kind of insecurity, a particularly disordered narcissists called attachment insecurity. And when that becomes strong enough, that's when people start to kind of soothe themselves with feeling special in an addictive way, instead of being able to derive that from closeness and connection and love. Um, now, there, we get very focused on extroverted narcissism, as I call it, which is the loud, brash kind, or when it comes to the, the unpleasant version, the narcissist we all know and loathe, I say. Uh, but then there's also introverted narcissism, and these are introverted narcissists agree with statements like, um, I'm more temperamentally sensitive than most people, or most people don't understand my problems. And you can see that has nothing to do with feeling great about yourself. In fact, they have low self esteem. They genuinely have low self esteem, and they're quite happy to report they don't feel good about themselves. Uh, but what the way they they prop themselves up and feel special as feeling uh, like their pain is unique. They're the most misunderstood geniuses on the planet, or they're, uh, or they're the ugliest person in the room, right? It's not about positive qualities, it's about negative. Uh, and then there are still others who agree with statements like, I'm the most helpful person I know. Who, who says that? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a psychologist and I wouldn't say that. <laughs> so I'm the most helpful person I know. That gets me every time. So that's called communal, communal narcissism. So we have healthy narcissism in the, well, let me go back. So narcissism drives to feel special. You can think of a spectrum from zero to 10 now. And on, at zero, we have people who are, who are afraid of special attention afraid of standing out, 
afraid of becoming a burden. Uh, at, in five in the middle, these people smack dab in the middle of healthy narcissism are people who feel a little special, just enough in order to pursue big dreams and persist in the face of failure, feel and be happy and healthy in relationships. And then you have people at the far right at 10. Uh, and these are people who are dependent on or addicted to feeling special, so much so that they demonstrate not just exploitation and entitlement, that core I talked about, uh, that captures all of unhealthy narcissism, but what I call triple E, exploitation and entitlement and empathy impairments. Mm -hmm. uh, so I already mentioned what uh, exploitation and entitlement are, but empathy impairments follow because if you're feeling so special that you would do anything it takes and hurt other people and you don't really you, you don't really care what happens now you've lost sight of another human being's experience so much so that you don't really care about other people's feelings that's an empathy impairment um, so the thing that spectrum opens up besides being able to move up and down it obviously which was always there again it just wasn't elaborated on people assumed it and talked about it even in my field in graduate school but no one even really talked about the flexibility and what would cause people to move up and down. But now we have this spectrum we can visualize. And on the bottom, there's another problem, uh, which is people who lack any healthy narcissism. And these are people I call echoists. I should say here, it turns out, uh, I did a lot of research in the beginning when I was writing this book to see if this term had been used before and I couldn't find anything. And then years later, uh, somebody alerted me the fact that there was an, a journal article in 2005 where somebody else introduced the term echoism and echoist and all of those. I, they don't use it the way I do. So we kind of came up with it independently. But in any case, I think of echoists as people who are, are afraid of seeming narcissistic in any way. They lack healthy narcissism. And in the research, not just mine, but in previous research where this wasn't called echoism, um, these are people who are often prone to anxiety and depression. Uh, they might even socially isolate. Uh, and, answer, and this is what I think of as echoism. Um, and we can, we can also do a deep dive into why people fall along different points on the spectrum. But uh, you want to think of the myth of narcissism and echo also when it comes to visualizing this with narcissists on one end. And their mirror, in a sense, is echo. Uh, Echo was the nymph who was cursed to repeat back the last few words that she heard, and she fell in love with the vain Greek youth, Narcissus. Um, and like Echo, Echoists often struggle to have a voice of their own, and they can fall into relationships with extremely narcissistic friends and partners. So that's the spectrum in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. The, you know, I, you did already touch on it, the, uh, you know, the, the roots of the narcissism, you know, when you talk about like the grandiosity, like we tend to think that what causes narcissism, and I think this is another compelling part of the book, is that it's too many gold stars, it's too much propping up, it's too much, you know, accolades, and that that's expressed when we see that grandiosity and that entitlement and that exploitation that that must have been what it came from. But, you know, there's this section that I highlighted in the book um, that again was really mind shaping for me, which is really, it seems like a lot of times it comes from, and I, you know, when I think back and reflect on my own personal experience and with personal, you know, people that I've known, um, it's really the absence of that. Like there's a, there's a deep root to it of where either your autonomy is completely stripped from you because you don't get to make choices. You know, they're being forced upon you maybe by another narcissistic parent or a parent with very self-serving needs. Maybe they're just emotionally immature or whatever. Um, or there's neglect, emotional neglect, where you just, you know, um, who you are, you, you don't have any connection with anybody. And then for some people, there's this deep sense of, I need to be seen. Like I, I just, I want to connect with the world in some way. And so I, I, you know, I feel for myself that that's where mine kind of rises out of is this not really being, you know, connected to the way my, you know, my wiring, the, my personality and whatever it is by a parent that just had no means to do that. And so it, it drove in me, like, I need to connect with the world and I'm going to just keep doing this on my own in, in many ways that I, that I can. And I think that's where I, the sympathy for narcissism is where it comes from me is when mm -hmm. I can see this with other people that kind of drift along in there's I, I, you know, I don't know, is that the more common 
root of where people will fall on the spectrum is usually this um, this lack of connection and not necessarily because, you know, again, they got all the trophies and all the gold stars and they were rewarded for crap that they didn't really earn or, you know, the myth that we have about how narcissism evolves. Yeah, that myth is a real problem because that is absolutely right. That is not what causes unhealthy narcissism. There's even research to support this, but we can just talk about it in a general way. I'm happy to share the research information as well. But um, it's always at the heart of it is a lack of a sense of connection, a strandedness and aloneness and being seen as a person no matter what. I mean, there is a kind of unconditional love that shapes us all that leads to feeling securely loved. And the problem isn't too many trophies for people who grow up uh, for, not, for doing nothing, for people who grow up narcissistic or extremely narcissistic to the point of disorder. The problem is either they only receive attention for doing big things, right? It's conditional. They, people start watching and care when you got the A mm -hmm. or when you won, a, when you got on the varsity football team or whatever it is. But when you were sad, they couldn't care less. When you were angry, they shut you down. They didn't talk. So it's never, ever been being built up too much by our family and our parents that causes extreme narcissism. It's being built up at the expense of love and care and connection. What you said was, was beautiful and I think spawn on, which is we have, all of us, a deep need to be seen. And at the heart of narcissism is a lack of faith that we will be seen as people and we will be seen for who we are. We have to make the world see us mm -hmm. that's the fear that we can't depend that's what turns a person into a performance so one way is only getting attention for big things another absolutely is just pervasive neglect and being made to feel that there's always one person up and another person down and if that's what relationships are i know which one i want to be right that's uh it's sort of kill or be killed Mm -hmm. atmosphere that happens with abuse and neglect lots of paths but at the heart of them is a failure to trust that people can really see and accept me as i am flaws and all no matter what whether i get the a or i get an f mm -hmm. right. yeah so absolutely well i think you know like i said i that was probably you know reading the book and stepping into your book, you know, back in 2015 was to be able to live with narcissists, but the, you know, going back to it after a couple of years, reading it again, going back into it after therapy, it was much more um, shaping for myself from that regard right there. And to also, um, I have to say, you know, creating and generating a little bit of love for myself for, for seeing yeah. All the things that were beyond my control, you know, I'm, I'm very happy that I am the person that I am today, you know, but you, you have to also, you can look at through this lens of the spectrum and actually begin to love the parts of you that are actually healthy yes. and actually are good. Mm -hmm. Uh, because it'll strip you've stripped away the polar thinking of it's good, you know, it's having it as bad not having it as good and really allows people to go, you know what, I can actually love and embrace the parts of me that I do think I'm special. I do think I'm good in these certain areas. I do think that, you know, I can do something for people. Um, and I think that, you know, for people to, to understand that part of it and to, and to, you know, kind of your, what your spectrum really does is, is, you know, really super important for that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do want to then talk about like healthy narcissism, you know, where, where can we capture this um this definition and i know we've kind of touched on it and we've weaved in it but you know where where does it fall in your spectrum and then when do um because when you do the test and i did do the test in the book um and it's something again that you you have online you know you do have everybody score themselves in that deficit category the healthy narcissism category and then also the extreme because we do have tendencies to fall somewhere you know, we, we'll score at some degree in those three categories for the most part, and we should to some degree, right? Like we should have a little bit mm -hmm. of the points in each mm -hmm. of those three categories. So can you, can you, would you mind elaborating on that? And then where, um, how somebody might spectrum, you know, score themselves on the spectrum. And I know you throw caution, you say it in the book, please be cautious when you score yourself. <laughs> 
So, because it can be dangerous, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. I, probably the best overview is just, again, in our relationship. And this is really how I thought about when I was developing it. You know, if narcissism is all about feeling special and a sense of specialness in some way, uh, our position on the spectrum is always where we stand in relation to that. Right? Do we flee it out of fear? Do we fear that we're going to be viewed negatively and judged for showing any little bit of grandiosity? And I want to I want to remind people that they already know healthy narcissism, right? That that they already know what that experience is of, of big dreams. Everybody has some image they can that they can relate to of the toddler who comes up and toddles up and says, "I'm Batman, right? And, and I'm a princess." And of course, you would never say to that toddler, "Well, you can't be both, right?" It, it's <laughs> it's the play of it. And eventually, people eventually we outgrow it simply because we move on to more realistic things. But that's really the heart of it. And we know that's how we know it's just a part of our nature and something we we often have to play with. But you can think of. Uh, where do we stand in relation to the dry fuel special? If we flee it and we're afraid of it, that's echoism, and you're going to be in the zero to four range. If we are zero to three range, excuse me, if, well, yeah, zero to three. And four to six, you're going to find moderate, uh, a moderate enjoyment of feeling special. That is, being able to accept it and enjoy it and uh, dip into that feeling when it actually helps us and helps us get ahead, uh, but not getting so dependent on it at, at the expense of relationships. And th it's perfectly captured by, well, there's one, there's one statement on the narcissism spectrum scale that we came up with that I, I think is really emblematic of this stance, which is, um, I I feel I think it's like I feel special but not at the expense of my relationships. Mm -hmm. I, and I'm forgetting my own inventory, but I think that's pretty much it. Let's see if I can. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I like to get I, I like to get ahead. Yeah, help me out. What is that? Yeah, I like to get ahead, but not at the expense of my relationships. Or I strive uh, for more, but not I at like, the expense. I like I like to dream big, but not at the expense of my Thank relationships. You. Yeah. Perfect. That's it. That's even better than what I was coming up with and recalling mm -hmm. in the moment. Yeah, mm -hmm. I like to dream big, but not at the expense of my relationships. And even though that's a kind of double-barreled statement, of course, people who don't like to dream big, echoists are going to say no. And people who don't care about relationships are, or, and notoriously, the more narcissistic people are, they devalue love openly on mm -hmm. self-report. And caring. They, they prefer trophy wives and trophy husbands over a loving relationship, and they'll say so. Um, so on that question, of course, they, they won't say, well, no, I'm not going to ever give up my big dreams. Not, I don't care. You know, if it hurts my relationship, I'm going to keep the big dream. So it perfectly captures that center. These are people who are securely attached and know what secure love is, and because of that, they feel special. This is the link that I make in the book. Healthy narcissism is about feeling special to other people. Right, that with my wife and my kids and other people I love who love me, I'm the gleam in their eye, they're the gleam in mine. We feel special to each other. You know, we probably don't matter all that much in the grand scheme of the 7 billion people on the planet, but we probably shouldn't think that. It's not going to feel very good. <laughs> and we certainly shouldn't feel that with each other. Right? So that's the... That's the captures that sense of healthy narcissism and then it looks like we paused okay we paused for a second yeah but it's good it wasn't and too bad of course so, yeah. in the seven to ten range is where we find okay it is where we find dependence on or addiction to feeling special where um people will lie steal cheat do whatever it takes in order to maintain that sense of specialness it's not played with at all and this is where people feel special for the world and other and others. Mm -hmm. This is what turns a person into a performance. Mm -hmm. So I think that's you can view that and remember what anchors people in the center is secure attachment. Mm -hmm. That is when people feel if you feel when you're sad, scared, lonely, blue, when you're happy, when you're feeling joy, you know, have, it can be good things too, that you can turn to one special person or special people and feel like they'll be there for you. When push comes to shove. 
they're still going to care and see you. Go back to your your phrase, your words of being seen, because that really is so much of what it's about. We need that as human beings. Mm -hmm. And if we can't get it through love and relationships, we'll try to find it some other way. And that tips people into extreme narcissism. But it can also tip people into echoism. Mm-hmm. As if they feel they're going to be punished for trying to strive, if they're going to be called arrogant and selfish, if they're going to have, if their loved ones turn away from them in times of celebration, then they might develop this sense that the less seen I am, the better. I don't want to burden people with my needs. God forbid I have needs of my own. I wouldn't want to put that on anybody. So they bury their needs and they bury their sense of self in order to stay connected. Mm-hmm. So here we have people who perform to stay connected on one end and people who bury themselves to stay connected on the other. Obviously, we want to be in the center where we don't have to do anything and we can still stay connected. Mm-hmm. For sure. You know, the yeah. statement about dreaming big in the relationship part, too, you know, I think the, um, you know, you know, to the, there, I talk about like this whole realm of, you know, understanding our brain is all in the nuances, right? Um, and not because we tend to automate and go extreme because it's easy by definition. Um, oh, yeah. The, you know, so when I, when I thought about that and I had rescaled the, you know, um, before this interview, I just kind of wanted to look back through my answers that I put down in 2017 and, you know, where I was today. Um, and that one didn't really change for me, but I had to sit with it for a moment because it, it still caused, you know, a thought, which is dreaming big, but not at the expense of relationships, but there still is the nuanced difference of making sure it's, it's, it's a good relationship, (laughs) you know, um, that, that the statement doesn't mean that you're willing to forego your dreams in order to maintain connection because not all connections are healthy. And and like you've said, I'm, I'm so glad that you keep saying that it's about, secure healthy connections like that's really the difference it's not any relationship is worth putting on hold um or um or your dreams are worth putting on hold for these relationships but that the relationships have to be healthy and and um and and good and mutual you know that's one of those things that when we talk about in the field of of, um narcissism there's not a lot of mutuality between a person who's strongly and extremely narcissistic and someone who isn't um, but mutuality is a big piece of that and that healthy, that healthy middle in there, um, which, you know, can take yeah, time no, for people to have important. confidence there. Yeah. No, go ahead. Absolutely. No, that's a great point. Yeah. Um, one simple way to understand it is it's not a healthy relationship if, the, if these are people who don't support you in your dreams, mm-hmm. right? Part of attachment security is that you should be able to turn to people with your dreams too, even if it means taking the focus away from them a little bit. Again, all of this can be worked out in a healthy relationship. It can be talked about. It brings up feelings. I miss you. If you can say, I miss you, that can actually take you pretty far. If instead you get angry and demanding, not so much. Right. Now, the, the other thing too that um, is because it's about relationships and our nervous systems playing off, people can move up and down the spectrum, right? Depending on the state of their relationships. Like it's, it's not all just that, they, that we are static in one place, but that how we're engaging with somebody pushes us up and down to, um, like I said, 2017 was a very hard year for me. I scored higher mm-hmm. in the extreme narcissism points and I dropped it by eight, two years later in a, you know, some therapy. Um, and so, you know, so I, I guess, you know, for the pre-therapy and after therapy versions, it does seem like there, there is this, um, ability to not really change our, a lot of our truer essence, like, you know, the points don't shift that much, but there is the ability to change them on one end or the other, either through the relationship or through growth, right? That there's some sort of healing and curing or, or amendment that we can do. But, um, when I looked at the overall score, I, and I'm not the qualified professional, you are here, but I, I feel like our base drives are now baked in, you know, whatever those experiences were that we had as children that made us, you know, I'm a very independent, very confident in my abilities kind of person. It's probably never going to change. I'm 48 years old. I've met other people that are on the other end, you know, that, and that's how they are. But those extreme ends can actually be moved either by through experience or through help and growth, right? 100% true. Yeah. I mean, this is what I, I do in my in my practice, and I help people largely because of my platform, I think this is kind of about I help people all over the world. I consult with people who aren't local, and I provide psychotherapy to people who are. Um, and 
I would say 40% of people are somewhere in the range of having narcissistic personality disorder or you know, something and that's what brought them to me because of my work and my expertise. And then the rest are a mix of people who are just coming for general difficulties, but of that other 60%, a lot of them are people who are surviving relationships with extremely narcissistic friends, family, partners. So, and on one end, of course, in that mix of, of people around that 60%, a lot of people struggle with echoism. And then I've already talked about narcissistic personality disorder, it's, that's the upper end of the spectrum. People at those uh, different extremes of the spectrum have the opportunity, even if they're by temperament more inward. Uh, uh, obviously, people who are who tend towards echoism are more likely to be introverted, not necessarily. And if, if for people who don't know what that means, uh, my guess is a lot do, but just in case, it means meaning. It doesn't mean that you don't like to be around people. Introversion is a style, a cognitive and behavioral and emotional style where people are more inward, more reflective, take longer to respond uh, because they are processing it more deeply or in a different way and more extroverted, the opposite of introverted. These are people who are more outgoing, they can be louder, they can be more, uh, more comfortable with attention by nature. That's introversion, extroversion. There's plenty of evidence that that's wired in from birth. And obviously, more extroverted people are going to be more likely to be the, the, become, under the wrong conditions, I will say, uh, extremely narcissistic uh, in that loud, brash way. And people under the wrong conditions who are more introverted might tend towards more echoism. But within that, if everybody does their work of overcoming learned patterns, I mean, anything that's learned can be unlearned. No one is at birth. Uh, wired to exploit others, to put them down, to attack when they feel the least sense of threat. Everybody, again, temperament. Some people are born with more aggressiveness in them. That can be wired in, but the use of it is learned. Um, and anything that's learned can be unlearned. And all of these things are learned habits that when we feel like we can't depend on others for mutual care, closeness, connection and being seen uh, that will try to compensate that for that in other ways compensate to have a sense of self and to feel some illusory albeit illusory some sense of security in the world right so nobody is born feeling um, I better make sure I'm not a burden mm -hmm. and dial down my needs as much as possible and not ask for much that's learned and it's a learned fear that if i dare to be fully seen if i dare to have needs i will lose connection i might be punished uh, and what happens is people continue to leave out those feelings and parts of themselves to survive in present day long after they've left the environment created a sense of danger it's dangerous for us because we die without connection as human beings Right? That's why that's why attachment was wired into us. We need other people to survive. So when we're kids, especially our caretakers, it imprints us with a sense of danger. Oh my God! If I if I dare to say I, I'm angry, uh, I'm going to lose these people who are taking care of me. What am I going to do? And it imprints us with that sense of fear. You know, we could talk about the narcissistic version too, but basically it's the same thing. It's learning in therapy. And which hopefully becomes a model also for healthier relationships. Mm -hmm. There are spiritual contexts to be able to do this too, but developing more secure way of relating that not everyone on earth who's not healthy people are not going to punish us for having a moment of grandiosity. Mm -hmm. They're not going to punish us for having a strong need. They're not going to punish us for being afraid. They're not going to call us weak, right? We change is all about adapting to healthy relationships. I, I I say this over and over again. My job is not to help people adapt to unhealthy relationship environments. That's not my job. My job is to help people express themselves and have the full range of feeling, no matter where they are, 
and to be, get back to your point about healthy relationships. And that means being in touch enough with healthy, assertive anger to know if you don't like something in a relationship and it's not going to change, I don't want this anymore. And to feel like you're going to be okay and be able to leave. All right? That's a learned fear too. Oh my God, what's going to happen if I leave this horrible person? Right? So much so that I won't even see them as horrible half the time. But if you have a different model where you know that you can be cared about and supported and seen fully for who you are, then you can be angry and assert yourself. And if it can't be heard in that relationship, then you, then you have what you need in order to leave. Mm -hmm. So all of, that, all of that moves us closer to the center of the spectrum, no matter where we are on the extreme. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, this is one of those moments I take this big deep breath um, because like I said, you know, the somebody might looking at the title of the book, Secret to Recognizing and Coping with Narcissists, might assume that what this is is a guidebook for how to tolerate unhealthy relationships. And um, and like you said, it, it, that's really not the point, you know, um, of that. And so I'm, I'm glad for you to say that because for some of us that have been steering ourselves into these relationships over and over again, again, out of the sense of, you know, this was the big thing that I recognized was that it was my own wanting to feel special. And the more grandiose a person appeared, the more my ego was inflated for that. And that's why I, you know, I kept saying I was attracting them to me, but reality was like, no, actually you're, you're driving yourselves right into their pathways because they've got all the glitter and the, and the, you know, the, the spark and everything that makes you feel like if you can get their attention, then that means you're also special as well. And it was coming to that place of like, okay, well then I don't need to tolerate these unhealthy people. I need to know where my unhealthiness is you know, what it is that um, the traumas that I have to deal with and improve and, and heal. And then, yeah, you, you, you do, you, you move into um, such a beautiful, peaceful place in life when you can, like you said, assert yourself against those unhealthy situations. And, you know, and I put in here that I wanted to ask you about that, about when, you know, we're coping with narcissism, when it's salvageable and when it's not, because I think that is important. You know, one lesson that many of us that have, have grown up with this personality around us has to get to a point of knowing that um, while you and I just talked about that there's ways of moving on the ends, there are points of no return or there are points at which you have to exit, that you have to go and you have to move on. Um, and, you know, and when you work with people, what do you tell them that when you've hit that line of like, this isn't, this isn't healthy, you can't move forward. Now it's time to start thinking about plan B, you know, to get out. It's such a process because as I'm sure you're aware and anybody listening to this is going to be aware you can sometimes know that things are wrong and then it kind of, it slips away. Uh, friends might even say this person's abusive if it's a really bad relationship. But it's such a process because part of what happens is it, it's kind of scary to confront the reality. So we tell ourselves stories like it isn't that bad. Or sometimes this person has really good qualities. Right? Forgetting that we would never say to one of our kids if they came to us and said, my friend yelled at me and then they hit me in the arm and they have been doing it for, you know, the whole year. Some days they don't do it, but a lot of days they do. You would never say to your kid, well, it's great. Sometimes they don't do it. So there, there's probably some good in them, right? You, these are the things that we tell ourselves. So it's a process of figuring that out. So it is clear. So I will say what I always do. I will make it clear. And I always do. What amazes me, people can read my book and even come back from, back from it and say exactly what you were saying. You know, you're taking people off the hook for being narcissistic and you're not helping people in an abusive relationship. I'm like, well, I'm saying if you are in an abusive relationship that has what I call the three stop signs, your work is not figuring out the other person or inviting them to do work themselves. That's not your work. Your work is to stay safe. So big red flag in ourselves um, comes back to what a healthy relationship is. In a healthy relationship, there are two people and uh, there's an awareness. The technical term in the research is the reflective self function. I wish there was a better one. But it, there, there's, it means there's two people with their own experiences, their own defenses, their own problems, survival strategies, ways of processing the world and people. Um, and 
when we're when when all goes well, we can stay connected, but also know ourselves. Mm-hmm. We don't get wrapped up in oh my gosh, I wonder why they yelled at me that day. Right? I, um, I wonder what I did, or maybe I shouldn't have approached it that way. Right? We we develop an awareness that wow, what is going on with that other person? They yelled at me. I don't like being yelled at. That's the reflective self function. So a big red flag in ourselves, and I'm going to get into what I call the three stop signs, is as soon as we're asking, what did I do or what did I not do, and what can I do to change the situation when someone is being abusive, uh, we're, we're already asking the wrong question. Mm-hmm. The wrong question is, am I safe? Am I emotionally and physically safe? And the answer is actually very can be thrown into very clear relief with what I call the three stop signs. The first is denial. If you're in a relationship with someone and they they drink too much or they yell or they're extremely narcissistic, whatever it is that hurts you, and it will hurt you, it hurts us as human beings, and they can't even reflect a little and say, I think there's something wrong. I think I might need help. That level of denial when people have it, they're not going to change. Uh, uh, you know, an, a, another stop sign is another aspect of that stop sign is um, if if you want to get help in a relationship, say finding a couples therapist, and the person won't go, it's not going to change. Uh, you can do what you can as you yourself to to change yourself, and that might even lead you to be able to leave a relationship but it's not going to fix the relationship by itself. Um, It can invite people to be healthier, right? I can become my best self. um, And by modeling that I'm going to say when I'm angry without attacking and without putting people down, and I'm going to say what I don't like, and I'm going to express joy when I feel it. And I'm going to ask for my needs to be met when I have them without pressure and without anger or criticism either. I can do all that but the person may or may not meet us there, right? And that's how we find out whether or not the relationship is, it can be sustained. Um, so one is denial, another is psychopathy, right? These are the, these are the stop signs that if you see them, you, you're gonna need help leaving a relationship if you can't do it under your own energy or steam yet. I say yet because anyone can eventually, I promise everyone listening that that's true. Psychopathy is a pattern of remorseless lies and manipulation. Right? This falls in the line with extreme exploitation and entitlement. Mm-hmm. If I feel like the world should bend to my will, um, I'll take whatever I want. I'll mm-hmm. steal from my kid's college fund, whatever it takes. Mm-hmm. Right? And I'll lie to your face while I'm doing it. And if you see that, that is no longer just narcissism. It is not. But people confuse those two. That is psychopathy. Psycho- psychopaths are narcissistic, but narcissists aren't necessarily psychopaths. Um, that is a dangerous sign. Um, and so we've got psychopathy, denial, and abuse. Right? Straightforward abuse. The other stop sign. You can't heal in a relationship that's not safe. Even if you have an awesome therapist, even if you have the best therapist in the world, what changes us is to be able to be in healthy relationships. And that can start with an excellent therapist, but we need outside of therapy to start nurturing healthy emotional environments too, especially if we didn't grow up with them. Mm -hmm. So those are the three stop signs. But again, I want to reiterate because I want it ringing in people's ears. Your question should not be, is this person narcissistic or are they drinking too much? Or it's, are you safe? That should be the question. Mm-hmm. And if you need help answering that question, you get help answering that question. Yeah. But even if the ninety-nine percent of the time, people already already know the answer, and the reason they go back to wondering what's going on and if they can fix it is because it's too painful to say this can't work, mm-hmm. and that's what they need help with the mm-hmm. grieving of it. Right? Yes. Yeah. So. Definitely. Um, 
and my skin is like, there's a, one of those, especially as you went through those, um, you know, I, I mentioned this on the show that sometimes these episodes do trigger me because I'm having these conversations and they're relevant mm. and stuff. And so mm. going through that, that was really important, those last three. And, you know, to be clear, you don't need all three stop signs to make the no go. It's any one of those stop signs is you go True, and stop and get out of there. Of yeah. Yeah. They're not any cumulative, one. everybody. Like, you know, they're one of Thank those. You. And if you have Thank more you. than one of them, then you definitely need to be packing up and, and moving along your way. So, yeah. 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 Um, so do you have any other resources besides the book for people to, to find you? I believe there's some YouTube videos that you also share on the topic yes. and stuff. And I'm, yeah. I'm hoping to get more active on YouTube again, as you know, the background story I've been sharing, which is I'm in a remodeled house at the present and we were worried we wouldn't even have the internet. So it's been a little hard for me to find time and space to do things like this again. You're the first of the year, actually. Yes. No, wait, that's not true. I had, oh. I had one that I went <laughs> to New York for. I forgot. It's been a while now. It feels like forever. <laughs> it's like I went to one in New York. Um, but this is kind of, I'm hoping to get up and running. I have a YouTube channel that people seem to like that's imaginatively named Dr. Craig Malkin. So you can find that easily enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have started, I have started a support group because I think there's a real gap in this. And again, it might be a little overly ambitious, but I, I really am devoted to it at, um, at creating a community of people who struggle with echoism mm. and how to overcome it. So I have my Dr. Craig Malkin, also imaginatively named, uh, Facebook page. And a subgroup of that is the Echoism support group page, which is currently public and open. Just go to Echoism. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's called Echoism with Dr. Support with Dr. Craig is the name of the page. Echoism support with Dr. Craig. Perfect. And uh, so you can type in Echoism, you'll find it. And it's public, so you can easily find it. And there's already a community starting there. And I'm planning to have events um, at most you know, I'll be chiming in a discussion if I might have some low fee events because, you know, not everybody can afford to come to me for services. And so I wanted to reach more people too. Um, so there's that. And I'm on Twitter. I often interact with people on Twitter. Also at Dr. Craig Mountain. We try to make this easy. <laughs> All mine's named Ami Coney, So I get it. It's like, make it simple. <laughs> right. right. And uh, for anyone who wants to take a brief but research validated version of the narcissism spectrum uh, scale test, the nar narcissism spectrum test, um, the, on my website, Dr. Craig, you can actually go to the narcissism test. I think it's just, you can just type that in your browser, but also at drcraigmalcolm.com. Just click on the narcissism test and you can take it. It's just nine questions. And for, for math geeks or, or statistic geeks out there, it correlates 0.9 with the official research, longer research version that's in my book, which is not bad. So it's not, it's not going to be perfectly yielding the kind of information and scores you get from the longer version of the book, but it's really not bad. Mm -hmm. um, oh, you, perfect. We, we, yeah, psychometricians pray for that kind of correlation with the brief <laughs> test. <laughs> Cool. Well, and so, for everybody that knows the show, all the links, you know, I'll go get the links and they'll be in the, in the podcast notes. Everybody can, you know, just click those buttons there. And then for people that are watching, you know, on YouTube, this is what the cover looks like. So you can get uh, your copy of the book, uh, still standing the test of time after five years since you published the book. So um, really, um, really good stuff in there. Uh, and like I said, oh my gosh, I just, this has been a thrill to be able to meet you and talk to you. Um, mm -hmm. And I appreciate that you've taken this much time to, to, um, to speak with me and let me ask you questions and said, this is just like, you know, just a few, it's like, gosh, we just keep going on, but it's been wonderful. And mm -hmm. so I'm really grateful. Oh, for your time thank today. you. It's been wonder wonderful for me too. And I really enjoyed your questions and I enjoyed chatting with you and I loved hearing your story. Cool. Thank you.